Thank you for joining Bowtech Live and the Nate Zielinski Podcast. This is all about education, scouting, building patterns, and being successful on public land in a do-it-yourself style hunt. A huge thanks to all of our partners, including Bowtech Archery, Diamond Archery, Excalibur Crossbows, Vortex Optics, Ford Trucks, Slumberjack, Fast Pro Shops of Denver, Mr. Heater, Turkey Creek Studios, Ripcord Rest, Tight Spot Quivers, and Black Gold Sights. Join us every Monday night live at 7 p.m. Pacific on the Bowtech Archery or Nate Zielinski Facebook pages, bowtecharchery.com, and or the Nate Zielinski YouTube channel. And remember, tag and share this live feed with your friends and bring your big game questions. And here's your host, Nate Zielinski. Final word. All right, we are good. Guys, welcome. I am Nathan Zielinski coming to you live from the Bowtech Facebook page, uh, as well as the Bowtech website, the Diamond Facebook page, Nate Zielinski's Facebook page, my personal page, uh, and Tightline Outdoors. So no matter where you're joining from, we really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch it live. Uh, hopefully you guys can gain some information from this tonight uh, to make you a better hunter and be more successful this fall. That's kind of the goal. Uh, at any point in time, again, guys, you have questions. Uh, make sure you comment. Comment below. We would love to answer those questions. I know we have some questions that we didn't get to last time that we're going to talk about this time. Um, so definitely comment in, tag your friends, bring everybody involved. Again, this is all the, the opportunity to hopefully make you a better hunter. Uh, you know, again, it's all a learning curve. You talk to a lot of people um, that, you know, have been majorly involved in the outdoors and no matter what level you're at, it's all that learning experience. So uh, we got a great show for you tonight. We're going to be talking about the mistakes. Uh, again, this is something that I probably say I, I see myself, things that I personally do, things that I see in the field, see that things I hear going on. Uh, a lot of this things that I guided, uh, you know, elk, mule, deer hunts, uh, bear hunts, things like that. So we're going to be talking about all that tonight, the biggest concepts and mistakes that the average person makes uh, out there in the field. Before we get started with that, uh, I'm going to walk you through where I personally have been and where I've been at with my personal scouting. Uh, been out in the field a lot lately, uh, having a great time scouting. Again, like we talked about in the last couple weeks, uh, the summer heat, for my opinion, definitely Definitely helps me out. Uh, there's no doubt it can shorten the time that the animals are out. Uh, a lot of times these animals are bedding down fairly quick if you're dealing with a lot of heat. Uh, I know I've been talking to a lot of whitetail hunters, you know, in the south, uh, you know, and east coast are like, man, my animals are, are hardly out just because of the overall heat. But Regardless of where you're at, the heat a lot of times bring patterns. Uh, it's going to dry up a lot of the abnormal water holes. So a lot of the areas that in spring have a lot of moisture, a lot of the creeks, ponds, you know, little ditches that have water, hopefully by now the heat has started to, to get away with some of those abnormal. So hopefully now the water that is left uh, is going to be very functional water come this hunting season. So hopefully everything that you're on now uh, is going to stay with you and going to be a, a very solid pattern for this upcoming hunting season. So those are a few things that we really like about the heat as, as it drives patterns into these animals. Um, you know, I've been doing scouting for everything. I've been doing a lot of elk, deer, uh, sheep, pronghorn, bear. Those are kind of the animals I've been watching. Uh, I personally don't have a sheep tag. i got three buddies that have sheep tags this year. So kind of a, a high draw rate for a lot of our friends and our hunting groups. Uh, so I'll be spending time with all three three of those guys uh, this coming season, this coming fall, I should say. Uh, so I'm doing a lot of scouting with them, just trying to make sure that they uh, capitalize and make the most of those hunts. Uh, again, kind of sometimes in most situations, those sheep tags are hard to come by. So where I've personally been, as far as the elk go, uh, I've been scouting elk high and low. I've had them in really low elevations in a couple units. I've been scouting tree line in a couple units, uh, finding elk everywhere I've been. Um, you know, I went out scouting yesterday. Uh, I spent my first really hard day in the field or hard weekend in the field, uh, and it was great. I saw, I think I saw 190 elk total. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of bulls, a lot of cows, a lot of calves. Um, to be totally honest with you, so far, uh, a lot of people get mad when you talk about the, the size and the quality of animals you're watching. Uh, I've seen a lot of animals so far. I can't tell you that I've seen that many giant elk. Now again, for what I'm personally looking for is I'm looking for the king of all kings. Not the fact that I'm a trophy hunter, just the fact that I love this process, what we're going through right now. I love the scouting. I love finding an animal in July and trying to stay with them until September, October, November. Um, I love those habits. I love the, the achievement that you get when you stay with an animal this long. Um, and put that animal on the ground months later. And that's what I, I strive for. And I love hunting the, the smartest animal out there, you know, the bull that's, that's escaped everything else. I love chasing that animal for that reason. Uh, so things like that. Um, to be honest, in the elk scouting world so far for me, I have seen a pile of bulls that are going to be incredible 
next year, the year after, three years from now. Um, I've had the best scouting I've ever had for three years from now. Bulls that just need a little more. Uh, I actually got a thing on my phone. Normally, we'd pull it up here on the TV. Guys, we're having some slight little issues with the TV, but I'm going to pull it up on my phone. Hopefully, you can see this. This is a particular bull that I've been seeing. I've seen him three, four times now. Um, the fronts on this particular bull are just tremendous. He's got giant fronts. He's got some of the best thirds I've seen. Uh, this is a Colorado bull. We don't, or Colorado, I should say, isn't known for having good thirds on a lot of our elk. And this bull here has got giant thirds. Uh, uh, got a lot of mass. He's got good mass in his swords in that fourth point, and then he just peters out. He's got no top end. Uh, you know, his fourth points, those big swords are short. They're heavy, uh, massy, but they are short. Um, so regardless, this bull is not a shooter this year. Well, coming forth, if he can grow some top ends to match these bottom ends, uh, he is absolutely going to be a, a flat-out giant. Uh, we'll see if you can see that right there. Hopefully everybody can. You can see that bull if you can watch it right there. Again, you'll see him turning his head. Giant, giant front end. You know, first, second, and third points on this bull are just incredible. And I know everybody's sitting there like, man, I would shoot that thing in a heartbeat. And he's definitely a bull that would be, be worth shooting. Um, but again, in the opportunity of letting that bull live a couple years, um, it would be tremendous to see what that bull can, can top out at. So seeing a lot of bulls like that that just need a couple years on them, they're going to be, be flat out amazing. Um, but regardless, I've had a great scouting trip, seeing a lot of bulls, uh, so that is definitely dialed in there. Uh, as far as the deer thing goes, same thing. I have deer high and low, been watching a variety of uh, got my eye on one buck right now that... I think he's going to end up being good. You know, right now we're getting to that tail end of that growth. So right now, you know, we're going to have, say, another two to four weeks of growth, depending on the area in which you're at. Uh, we're, we're generally speaking going to say we have about 20 days left of major growth on these animals. I'm really hoping this buck I watch, is watching right now just flourishes. I'm hoping all his tines open up. Uh, obviously, he's not going to be a super deep tined animal, uh, but regardless, he is a, he's a good buck. And this buck, I'm, again, I'm just hoping that he these tines kind of mature up on this animal uh, and he kind of blossoms but you can see that buck right there he's wide he's heavy uh, really solid bull or solid buck right there so just kind of uh, right there perfect hopefully you guys see that again uh, no that's not uh, how we normally do this but that's what we're showing you so again watching some good bucks the bucks are very patterned right now I have them on water I have them on grass uh, so so far having a great scouting trip for that uh, as far as the uh, the pronghorn this is probably the one that's giving me the most trouble I have, I have a, a handful of pronghorns that I, I've really been watching big bucks and I'm excited about it. a lot of these. I have a couple non-typical bucks. I have a couple regular just good bucks. I'm really, so far, all of all of my tactics for scouting for the pronghorns have gone extremely well. Um, I have a hard time sitting on water for pronghorns. It's long days in the heat. Uh, I get antsy. I get fidgety. Um, so, you know, when I'm sitting on water for elk or deer, I can usually only see a couple hundred yards. So in my head, the animals are almost always right there. So that's what keeps me sitting on a water hole for elk and deer because I think they could come in at any minute. On pronghorn, I can see for miles and miles. And when you first see one, it might take them a couple hours to show up. So the opportunity or the, you know, the situation of me seeing those sense gets to my head and I have a hard time sitting on water for pronghorn. So like we talked about in the past in that pronghorn show, I tend to really chase the pronghorns. I want to spot and stalk. I want to sneak up on them. With that being said, we use a lot of decoys. You know, we use a cow board or a cow decoy that we walk up to them on. We use pronghorn decoys to walk up on them. You know, we'll use horses or donkey or cattle or livestock in the area which you're hunting. We'll try to walk and lead those up to them. So we have a lot of chances to, to use as a decoy to pursue these animals. So far, Everything I've done has worked. The cow board's working. The pronghorn decoy's working. I used a, a donkey that was actually in a farmer's field. It walked up to it. So I've had a lot of success sneaking up on these animals. And I'm starting to think that I'm not so good. I think these are just in that summer. They're used to traffic. I think they're just kind of being lazy. I have a feeling that's going to change come hunting season. So I'm a little bit on pins and needles here going through this next month, uh, wondering what's going to change and what patterns I'm going to develop as I go forth with that. So those are kind of the big things I've been on. The sheep have been up and down, seeing a, seeing a lot of rams. I can't tell you that I've seen a, a giant ram, uh, but I also can't tell you that I spent that much time scouting for them. You know, I had numerous days in the field, uh, but when it comes to, to sheep scouting, you know, you're putting a lot of miles on, covering a lot of ground. Uh, I mean, you just don't see as many animals as you would in like an elk or a deer situation. So the sheep scouting is going good, uh, but I can't say it's dialed in there. I'm hoping my friends uh, who actually have the tag 
I'm hoping they get some more time in the field and actually uh, get a little bit more of a pattern. But on the, sh on the scouting I've been on them with, uh, I haven't found anything absolutely dynamite. Um, so now we're going to get fourth and another thing. Last thing I'm going to talk about here, uh, about my personal attributes that we've been doing, just so everybody can kind of follow along. Um, this past weekend was my first extremely physical weekend um, in the field. I've been doing a lot of scouting, a lot of infield stuff, but... You, the, obviously, the the training and the physical, you know, dedication to hunting is the top thing right now. It's the hottest trend. Um, you know, everybody's hitting the gym, doing the weights. Everybody's about the physical, getting ready for the hunting season, and that's great. We definitely preach that you have to do that. Um, we personally, and me personally, I really promote doing more scouting than I do the gym time. I think that time in the field is is extremely valuable. Obviously, you have to be in shape enough to to go through with your hunt. But I think scouting is going to do you a lot of good more so than the extra effort on the physical. Uh, I try to combine them. Do your physical activity in the woods while scouting. Put a little bit more weight in your pack. Carry some dumbbells in your arms. Try to combine the scouting with the physical. Um, but the one thing that we talk about, a lot of people have been out hiking, getting prepped for this hunting season, and I see so many people that do a one-day scout. So they go out for one day, and they hit it hard. I mean, they're out there hiking. They got weights in their backpack. And they beat it, and they do a five mile, a ten mile hike, and then they come back and they relax the next three, four days, five days, and then they do it again. But they're separating their hikes with a week, you know, span in between to recoup. As to where the average hunting season, you're doing five to seven to ten days straight in a row. So Saturday, I I, I forced myself to to go on no sleep. So Saturday, I did like a 17 hour day. Um, you know, just busy time scouting, but I did most of the scouting from my vehicle, short hikes, nothing crazy. But I definitely went to bed extremely late. I went to bed at 11, and I woke up at 1 a.m. To, to actually start hiking at about 3 a.m. Um, on the on this uh, when I was scouting sheep and elk. So with that being said, I forced myself to have no sleep, and then I did a 13 mile hike, uh, roughly for for the sheep and the elk to really push it. And then I started again this morning doing a little bit more physical, with the concept being uh, of going on no sleep, putting the physical ability on your body to test it and then trying to go on no sleep the next day just to see how your body handles it. because in reality that's going to be more of a realistic situation in the hunting world so again just food for thought everybody's out there training try to push yourself multiple days in a row because that's going to be more realistic to the average hunting season instead of a, a one-day hike then a week to recover and then another one-day hike on a weekend so push it just make sure your body is, is able to handle that figure out the, the nutrition you need and things like that so again just got to keep that in mind now we're going to go forth, the actual topic of the night. Uh, again, I'm Nate Zielinski, coming to you live from Botech. If you're just joining us, and a huge thanks to Botech Archery for providing us their live feed platform for doing this tonight. Uh, make sure you give them uh, a look and a comment for uh, letting us go live. We really appreciate that. Um, the name of the topic for tonight is the mistakes made while in the field. This is going to be scouting and hunting. We're going to start off with scouting and then roll into hunting. But there's so many little things that make or break a hunt. Little things that usually contribute to tipping an animal over and having that harvest in the woods. Um, so again, I can't tell you enough how many times the small details, again, make or break a hunt. We talk to hunters all the time that aren't successful. And so many times I, in my head, I'm like, boy, they're, they're not even close. But after you listen to them, you hear their stories, they're like 99% of the way there. They're just missing that little piece. And again, that's that piece from letting them harvest that animal. So we're going to talk about those small details. Some of this stuff is very basic. I'm sure you've heard of it. The other stuff, hopefully it uh, clicks with you and you can say, hey, that's something new. I've never heard that before. So bear with me. We're going to walk through it and, and kind of go with that. The number one mistake always made is the wind. Now, everybody on here is listening and saying, we know how to play the wind. But wind is, again, the most crucial thing in scouting and in hunting. Knowing the thermals, knowing the wind, and understanding how far it carries is detrimental to your hunt and the success of your hunt. Um, and more importantly, it, it's such a way to, we dedicate so much time and energy and money into our hunts, and all of a sudden, in literally the, the sweeping of a breeze, you can ruin everything. So knowing that wind, the top of that wind or those thermals uh, is absolutely crucial. The number that I always have in my head, now a lot of times they're going to wind you even further than this, but the number that's always stuck to my head is that these animals will smell you within 700 yards. So that's my rule. If I am within 700 yards of the animal itself, of a water hole, of their bedding area, that right there is my limit of absolutely I cannot go any closer. Now, in the right situation, you get a nice can that's compressing that. You get nice cold air that holds that density. You know, they could probably smell you 1,500 yards away. Um, and that's going to be elk, mule deer, whitetails, any of the big game species. A bear is going to smell you three times what an elk would smell you. So 
all of these animals have the most keen nose, and I don't think we give them credit for it. You know, we give the white tail credit for their nose, but a lot of times we, we miss thinking about the mule deer, the elk, uh, you know, the bear, of having these unbelievable noses. So every time that you're in the, the woods, do you know where your wind's at? We always know the thermals. We always know that big, heavy breeze. But when that wind's swirling, when it's calm out, when it's a nice, sunny day, do you know those light thermals? And even in the lightest thermal, I mean, to where you do smoke in a bottle and it barely moves, animal within 100 yards of you. Make sure you always know your wind. Um, and at no point in time should you ever get caught up in those bad situations. Uh, so that's something to think about. Again, always know your wind. Now, talking about wind tunnel, Everybody has their topic on this, and you can talk to a million hunters out there, and you'll get a million different answers. Uh, I mean, you have the option of scent-controlled clothing. You know, you have scent lock and sprays, and again, there's an entire industry built upon no scent clothing and hiding that scent. Uh, you know, I see I mean, a hunt with a million people that, you know, they wear their normal clothes, and they don't change until they're in their tree stand, you know, or they don't change until they're in the field chasing elk. In a whitetail situation where I'm somewhat controlled, I'm not hiking, I'm a fairly big believer in the clothing and the cover scents. In a western Rocky Mountain region scenario where I'm chasing elk, mule deer, where I'm actively moving, I'm very physical, uh, it all goes out the window. At that point in time, I am 100% playing the wind. Now, I have some buddies that absolutely cringe because I'll put my camel on in my house. I'll stop by the drive through and pick up a milkshake on my way out, you know, as I'm starving because I've been hunting for 20 days straight. Um, and I'll eat food, I'll be in my truck, I'll be in my in my everyday atmosphere, in my clothes, because I know I have to play the wind. I don't know that no matter what, whether I'm scent covered or that, I mean, there's enough sweat coming off of my eyes and my eyelids when I'm hiking so hard to ruin a hunt. So I know that I'm a physical enough in the woods that I create enough odor and enough smell that I know no matter what, I'm gonna ruin my hunt if my wind is not correct. So at that point in time, it kind of all goes out the window. I lead that normal life. Uh, I don't let the, the options of scent control you know, ruin my day because I know I have to play that wind. So again, the number one thing that will kill you in hunting, period, is that wind. So everybody out there, make sure you put a focus on scouting the wind, scouting the thermals, and make sure you're aware of that in the field hunting. And that is while pursuing animals, as well as leaving for the day. That's one of the biggest things I see is guys will pursue animals, the animals will go to their bed, they kind of hang out, try to figure out their plan, the thermals will be switched, and they'll start walking back out to their camp, walking out to their truck, but they're still within three, 400 yards of the animals, and the wind will suck right to those animals, and even though they're not pursuing them, their hunt's ruined. So again, in pursuit, walking out, and all times that you're in the make sure that wind and make sure it's in control and in your favor so think about that it's going to help you out a lot um next thing we're going to talk about i've been talking with a good friend of mine he's watching this right now his name's john um he's been having he's a new hunter you know second third year into it uh doing amazing getting on a lot of animals having a great time uh i mean he's breaking all the all the trends for vacation he's doing great but in his particular situation, he is hunting elk. Um, he is seeing bulls and bulls and bulls and bulls and very few cows. And it's awesome because that's what he's in pursuit of. He wants to kill a big bull. He's found big bulls. He's found numerous big bulls. Um, but the problem is there's no cows. And this becomes a situation of understanding, or more so than understanding, guessing where the rut's going to take place. And this happens a lot in a lot of different situations. You'll have, you know, males, whether it's a buck or a bull in one area, and, you know, cows or does in another area, and you have to ask yourself, you know, are the cows going to move to where the bulls are in that area for the rut? Um, because I guarantee in the male-female world, when it comes time to breed, the boys will chase the girls. It's just like real life. It's just like anything else. The boys always come running. So in the average situation, you really have to know both species. I don't care if you're just hunting bulls or just hunting cows, um, you're just hunting does, just hunting bucks. You have to know where both of them are at to understand where it's going to take place. Now, sometimes they meet in the middle. Sometimes the bulls are going to have to come all the way to the cows. Sometimes when the, when the dropping season of the, of the calves or fawns is done, those animals will come back into the general vicinity. So sometimes you do see these animals moving uh, due to that time where they're, where they're dropping their young for the year. Um, but regardless, coming up here right now, we're mid-July, um, animals should start getting into their very normal pattern. So if you're not finding both sexes, You've got to make sure that you're on top of that to know which one's which uh, and where it's going to take place. Again, you still have to scout where the bulls are at. You still have to try to find some cows. 
and just got a guess of where it's going to happen. Are the bulls going to come down? Are the cows going to come up? Or, or vice versa, um, you know, whatever situation you're in. Um, but you got to make sure you have a, a rough idea of where that is because it's rough when you scout for months and months, have a pattern of the bulls, and all of a sudden, you know, it starts getting cold. You know, the rut starts kicking in, the testosterone's flowing, and they bail to go look for the female. So keep that in mind. Again, another little small tip and mistake commonly made, everybody gets focused on one species or one gender. Make sure that you know where both genders are to make sure you can understand that pattern of when that rut takes place. And again, a lot of this is going to be guesswork of what they're going to do, but put as most education as possible until you have a rough idea of where that might take place. So kind of keep that in mind. Um, Next thing we talk about is setting up uh, tools for the hunt. So setting up trail cameras, setting up blinds, setting up tree stands. Uh, the number one thing, these are educational tools. These are things that are going to help us be successful this coming fall. With that being said, don't ruin a hunt while trying to set this stuff up. I see so many times that people want to set a camera on a water hole or set a camera on a trail, <coughs> excuse me, or set a, a camera outside of a bedding zone. Um, Make sure that you know where your animals are at when you're going in there to set these up. Make sure that you have a, a rough idea of, you know, what's going to take place. Are, are these animals in their beds and the wind is going whatever direction when I set that camera up? Are these animals actively drinking when I'm trying to do that? Most of us are really good about that, but again, after I answer a lot of questions, I've been, you know, messaging people, um, you know, fielding a lot of questions, it seems like there's a lot of times where we might not make a decision and we actually can, can ruin animals while trying to set up these units or in particular, you know, checking cameras and, and, you know, pulling out SD cards and changing batteries. Um, I know we're always excited to go check those cameras and oftentimes, you know, instead of waiting till mid-afternoon when it's the peak time to go check these, uh, you know, we're checking them early in the morning when these animals are active. And that can hurt you in the long run. So again, just make sure you're aware of where the animals are and don't hurt your situation when trying to set up cameras, set up trail cameras, or uh, set up tree stands, set up blinds. Um, general rule for blinds and uh, tree stands. I generally tie, try to have these set up a minimum of two weeks before I plan on hunting. Maybe not necessarily before your actual season, but before I actually plan on hunting that area, whether it's a water hole or a trail or a meadow, um, you know, a feeding area. Again, I try to have it two weeks at a very minimum. If I can give myself six weeks, even better. So again, if you can have six weeks to where you can hang that tree stand, set up that blind, let the animals get used to it. Let the smells become aware. Let the, just everything that's new about it. We've all walked into a room and you get that eerie feeling, something's going on. Animals have that 10 times more than us. They, their instinct knows when things have changed. And let them, they can get worried about it, then come in the next time, get a little more used to it, you know, get a little more calm, um, and let them get used to that atmosphere so it's not spooking them so those animals aren't on nerve or on end uh, when it comes time to actually harvesting that animal. So again, two weeks is a minimum, six weeks if you have time to do that. But again, get those tree stands set up right now. Get the blinds set up right now. Go build your blinds out of sticks. But right now is the time to do that for this coming fall. So you got that September tag, uh, October tag. Get out there and set that stuff right now. It's going to help you out in the long run. Uh, I promise. Absolutely. It'll be, be great for you. Um, the number one thing, this is for scouting. I shouldn't say number one thing, but a very positive thing. Um, scouting and hunting. Everybody has their option of the bedding zone. You know, usually it's going to be dark timber in the early season. You know, damp, dark, cold, very safe. It's their home. Um, you know, so again, in there, whenever the weather is very warm, dark timber, cold, very safe. As it gets very cold, especially on the elk and, and mule deer thing, as you start getting into like November, they're going to start bedding on open hillsides. They have to have the sun warm them, but they still want cover of the trees. So like an aspen hillside is a great place for them. You see them sometimes in uh, scrub oak hillsides. They want to have some sort of bush, shrubbery tree to feel safe, but they want the sun to hit them. So again, Really hot out, they're bedding in the dark, nasty, thick. When it's really cold out, they're bedding out in the open a little more. But regardless, my rule, now I was taught this when I was guiding, uh, worked for a tremendous outfitter, uh, Eagle Spirit Outfitters and Steamboat. Um, they always protected their bedding zone. So at no point in time when I was taught you know, my elk hunting and when I was doing my career when I was younger in the elk world, um, we would never go into a bedding zone. And that engraved in my head, and I've done that ever since. And it's unbelievable the success it will bring you. I talk to hunters all the time that push the bed. They're like, oh, I know he's in his bed. We're going to go in there and try to call and pull him out of his bed. Or we're going to try to stalk these animals in their bed. Or we're going to push. We're going to walk through and spook them out there to our buddy on the other side. There's a million reasons why I hear people going in the bedding zones. 
if you want to be successful, if you want to start having that success rate every single year, leave the bedding areas alone. Let that be their sanctuary. Let that be their safe place. I don't care if it's the biggest animal you've ever seen in your life and he goes into that bed. Once they touch that bedding zone, back off. Consider that private land. Consider that an area you're not allowed to go in. I hunt private, or excuse me, I hunt public property just as I would private property. I almost act like I can manage it. Again, everybody tends to make bad decisions. If you can give these animals their time to cool down, give them their space, they'll come back to the same patterns. Even if you're putting pressure on them, they'll come back to those same patterns. Only beyond the point of that, that breaking point, do they not return? So again, figure out where their bedding zones are, watch where they go in midday, and once you know those bedding zones, consider that your off-limit zone. Stay out of the bedding zones, and I promise you, you'll have better hunts. So if you're out there in the morning, they go to their bed, back off. Hunt them that afternoon. Hunt them the next morning. Hunt them three days from now. But start protecting those bedding zones. Act like anywhere you're hunting is your own private reserve. But let them have their bedding zones, and I promise you, you're going to build better patterns. You're going to build truer patterns, and you're going to find it much easier to be successful in harvesting these animals. So again, bedding zones, always off limits. I don't care how big it is. I don't care the excuse. Leave the bedding areas alone, and I promise you, you're going to have a great time and more success in the field. So keep that in mind. Um, as we start getting into more of the hunting side instead of the scouting side, uh, again, common mistakes. If you're just joining us, I'm Nate Zielinski coming to you live from Botech. Um, we're talking about the mistakes made in the field that will oftentimes uh, you know, prevent people from being successful out there in the field. Um, one of the things we're going to talk about in the actual the hunting side you watch the, the podcast, you watch the live feeds that we're doing right now, you read the magazines, you watch the TV shows, all your information for hunting. Um, so much of it is preaching, get far back there, get beyond the crowds, get to the untouched areas. And I'm a big fan of that. So by no means am I saying that's not a good thing. I love going further, going you know to the areas that have never been touched. Um, but with that said... I think a lot of people pass animals. And more importantly, I think a lot of people push animals on their way into their average hunt. Sorry about that. So with that said, I always try to try to figure out my, my areas in which I'm hunting. So if I'm going to plan my day for scouting or for hunting, if I'm saying, hey, I'm going to get to this back bowl or this back little drainage or this back valley, I have to look at the area in which I'm hiking through. And I always ask myself, number one, what's the wind doing? Okay, so I got wind here, I got bedding here. Where could these animals be? So oftentimes, anytime I'm going in somewhere, especially far, I almost do a two-part trip. So I would love to go in there the night before I'm planning on going on a far hike or a far hunt. And I would love to scout the closer stuff and make sure there's no animals there that I'm going to spook. Number one, that I'm going to push into the next area which I'm actually going and spook those animals. Even though they might be a mile away, if you blow out the first set of animals, they might run into the second set and ruin that. Um, you know, speaking from experience, I've done this a lot. You know, you, you go in at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., making these far five-mile hikes in your hunt spot, and you push so many animals going in. One, you might push an animal that you might want to harvest. Two, you might ruin everything for your day because as you spook animals, they go on high alert, they take off running, and they blow out everything in the valley. Very rarely do you ever have nervous animals pass calm animals, and those other animals stay. If those animals are on that, that high intensity alert, they're on that scared run, uh, they take everything with them. So generally speaking, just think about that. Whenever you're going in, think about the area you have to go through or pass and make sure that you're okay to do so. So again, if let's pretend uh, you know, today I'm out here, if I'm gonna go on a far hunt tomorrow morning, I would scout the first trail or the first zone, per se, um, that I'm going to hike through. Make sure there's no animals there. Make sure there are not animals I'm going to hunt. Make sure that I can get through there without ruining anything and plan for that next day. So, again, consider your area and make sure you don't hurt anything while doing that. So, so keep that in mind as you're doing that. Um, also, don't overlook animals. I say that because, same thing, we see so many people caught up in the distance hunt. I gotta hike five miles to get these animals. I gotta get way back in this back area. It's all about this, this you know, far pack. But all of a sudden, you can see, especially in rougher terrain, you can see animals that get used to the daily hikers. They get used to the highway. Um, and oftentimes, there can be animals fairly close, especially in secluded, rougher pockets. And you have cliffs and some gnarly terrain right at your access point. But just beyond that, you have great, you know, habitat for these animals. These animals will stack up in there because they don't have pressure. Sometimes they're very close to access points. It's just through some rougher terrain. 
again, just talking about the common mistakes, I can't tell you how many times I've been successful, fairly close to access points, just in really rough terrain to where I park in a parking lot in a national forest, you know, trailhead with 15, 20 other hunters. Everybody's five miles in and I'm three quarters of a mile. You know, I practically had to rock climb to get there, but I'm on animals, I'm successful on unpressured animals because they're, well, think about hunting and think about those slight things that sometimes might get overlooked. Sometimes the overlooked spots can be those little gyms, those little honey holes uh, that can produce a lot of animals. So again, think about areas that you might overlook. Peeves, another mistake that we're talking about is staying in the field too long. This is one of the most common things. So it usually happens with, uh, we all love hunting, we all look forward to it. Right now, I'm sure everybody watching this is, is just jonesing to get out there. You're excited. So we wait months and months. I mean, some of us wait, you know, the 12 months, months from the last day hunted to get back in that field and all about it. We crave that time to get back out there. So all of a sudden the hunting time comes. Let's say it's, you know, an early archery season, elk, mule deer, whitetail, it's August or September. Um, and we're out there hunting. It's hot. The rut's not happening yet. The heat is, you know, the sun's high in the sky. It's hot out. Realistically, what are we hunting? An hour of the morning, maybe two if we're lucky. But generally speaking, these animals are going to be bedded very early in the day. You know, by 7 a.m., 8 a.m., these animals are bedded. So, so many times I am back in my vehicle if it's not happening early in the day. And I talk to some people that, you know, I'll talk to them, oh, hey, you, were you successful this morning? You're talking to buddies. And everyone's like, well, I'm still out here. You know, it's 10 o'clock. I'm like, what do you mean you're still out here? And they're like, oh, we're, we're still looking. The nature hike thing does far more damage than anything else you'll do. I mean, literally, once you're actually in the woods, as long as, you know, we, we have the wind that kills us, we have forward noise that kills us, but the nature hike thing is just as bad as all of them. Again, I know that you're excited to be out there. I know you don't want to waste your time, but you have to make the most of the opportunity. And sometimes making the most of that opportunity is getting out of the woods. So many times, guys, all they're doing is leaving scent. They're pushing their wind. They're pushing animals. They're scaring animals. <clears throat> by doing those those big nature hikes. So, do your scouting. We've been talking scouting. If you watch these animals bed down by 7 a.m., by 8 a.m., when you're out there hunting them, you need to be out of that area when they're bedded down. So when the animals are bedded down, you're out of there. <clears throat> Maybe you'll go to the next hill and take a nap on that and get far away from the animals, but regardless, you're not actively pursuing them. I see so many hunters that do their morning hunt, you know, they know that those animals went down at 8, and all of a sudden you see them at the hill. You know, I'm going to down, do some scouting, see what animals we see. <coughs> Excuse me. It's going to kill you in the long run. So again, the nature hike thing, if you're not on these animals, make sure you're backing off. Give them their time. Again, early in the season, August, September, there's a lot of days where I only get two hours of hunting. An hour in the morning and an hour at night. and Yeah, of course, I'm sitting at camp, sitting in my truck, sleeping on a ridge, and you're, you're bored out of your mind, but you're better off to do that. You're going to be more successful than you are taking the nature hike, trying to push animals, trying to, trying to push beds, uh, whatever you're doing. I'm not out there. I'm not exactly sure what guys do out there midday, but I see it all the time. I mean, again, do your scouting, but the second the animals go to bed, you need to back off. Avoid the nature hikes. Don't let friends take the nature hike. I promise you. It's a, it's a big reason why a lot of people are not successful. So back off in that situation. Um, next thing we're going to talk about uh, is calling. This is, again, that same situation. Now, we're going to have a whole show dedicated to calling here in the next couple weeks, uh, so I'm not going to get too crazy into it. But the common mistake, especially in an elk situation, is if the elk are not running, you got to be talking. If the elk are not talking, you are not talking. That's the rule of thumb. Everybody, especially early in the season, they grab their bugle tubes, they grab their cow calls, they're out there walking every hilltop, every 200 yards, they're throwing a bugle, they're letting the cow calls out. And literally all you're doing is educating these animals and putting pressure on these animals that's unnecessary. So think about that. Again, if the animals are talking, you can talk. But no matter what, you always want to be the less talkative person. So again, you never want to over talk. Whatever the elk's doing, do slightly less than that and you're going to be successful. We'll talk a lot about that when it actually comes time to calling, but again, it is, is far over calling. Calling too much, being too loud, and more importantly, being repetitive. So many people do the same tone, the same call. We all call it the flutophone, you know, the do-do-do-do, do-do-do-do. 
they do that same bugle on every ridge, every hundred yards. Uh, I mean, it drives me crazy. I'm sure it drives the elk crazy. So again, don't call too much. Don't call if they're not talking and change up those tones. I mean, again, we're going to talk about it at a later show, so we're not getting too crazy, but like a bugle tube that I carry. I carry three size tubes three ends of this tube, so we're literally on a daily basis, I can change up my tones, I can change up my voices, I can change up my volume. So thing I do, I have those three tubes. My cow call, same thing, carry different cow calls. Um, it's all day to at no point in time do these elk ever have me pinpointed. I'll do a bugle for a minute, then I'll change it up. So I keep them guessing, so I can hunt that same animal today, tomorrow, a week from now, and they never get old. The guy who has the same repetitive tone, oftentimes can hunt these animals one, two days, and all of a sudden they're blown out. These animals are caught onto them. They don't even respond anymore because they get used to those tones. They definitely do. So keep that in mind. Number one, don't call too much. Don't overcall. Definitely do not call if they're not calling. Let them be the first one to uh, to break the silence. Let them start the communication, start that conversation. Uh, and the big thing is, is don't don't have the same repetitive tone. Change it up, change your tunes, change your volumes, uh, and it's gonna help you out. Again, we'll have a whole calling session, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Next couple weeks, we'll have the calling session, uh, and you can learn more about that. But again, common mistakes, things like that. Um, next thing we're gonna talk about, guys, I know it's a long podcast, but we got a lot more, um, is when you're setting up on an elk. So, so many times we see this, especially in an elk calling situation, where I'm calling for myself, or I have somebody behind me calling to these elk. When we're set up, and he's you know in front of us or wherever the, the situation is, every time that we set up, so many times we sit right behind a tree. So we have a pine tree, we have a rock, we have a stick. And so many cases we sit right behind it and we're hiding behind that. And that bull comes in and we're like, yeah, that's great, I can draw my bow, he's not going to see it. But all of a sudden, more times than not, you're blocked by that object you're hiding behind and you can't take the shot. All of a sudden, that bull comes in and he pinpoints you. He looks you right in the eyes, and he's bu you're busted. He's got you. He can see right through you. He knows that the call is coming from right there. He doesn't see a cow. He doesn't see another animal, and they go on that high alert. They freeze. They look there for 20 seconds, and they turn around. And they run away. In an elk calling situation, they're not looking for a hunter. They're not looking for you, the caller. They're looking for another elk. Stand in front of the object. We're wearing camouflage. You're going to blend in with what's behind you. So stand in front of your object. Stand right in front of a tree. Stand in front of the rock. Stand in front of the brush. Whatever the case is, what you're hiding behind. Always stand in front. Yes, you feel like you're standing like a sore thumb. You feel like you're out in the open. You're going to ruin it. But those animals will look right through you looking for the call coming behind you. So again, you're going by yourself. Um, but these animals will literally look right through you. And at that point, no matter where that animal stops, usually you're going to be able to have a clear shot because you have no obstacles in front of you. <coughs> so keep that in mind in every situation or every setup that you take. When you're setting up, I don't care if you don't even know if there's an elk in the area. If you're stopping, if you're going to call, if you think there's even a hint of a chance, make sure that you're in front of that structure and that animal can come in and, and again, it'll look right through and you'll be set. But just never, ever find yourself hiding. That's the number one rule. Never hide from these animals. Be in front, be ready. It's going to leave you more successful. <coughs> With that being said, I spent some time at the archery range this last week. I'm getting my bows dialed in. i uh, actually getting a bow that I got set up for this winter. I'm planning on doing a snow hunt. Uh, so I got a bow that I painted all white. It's pretty cool looking. It's a Rain 7 that I got all dialed in. Uh, again, smart bow. This bow is incredible. Not talking about distance. Everybody wants to talk about distance and shooting. This bow shoots 150 yards. Amazing. I got a pin for 150 yards. Uh, it's incredible. I'm not planning on killing an animal at 150 yards, but regardless, it can do it. Again, just talking about the, the smart bow technology. Uh, but again, this Rain 7 got dialed in for winter for a snow hunt. But with that said, I'm at the range and I'm watching these people shoot. And everybody gets caught up on the pounders they're drawing. They're like, man, I need to throw a, a powerful arrow. I need energy. I need speed. And I'm watching these people literally getting ready. And I mean, I'm watching them draw their bow. And they're throwing their bow. And they're, you know, they're pointing to the moon and coming down. And they're pointing at the ground. And... I mean, I saw it all. These guys are like swinging like they're, they're in aerobics class trying to draw their bow back. And I'm thinking to myself, how are they going to do that on the animal? Again, we all talk about this. We all have our, our style. But in case you don't have a plan for this, in case you're the guy that thinks, huh, I don't know how I draw my bow back. The big thing for fuel for the thought. When you're set up, again, I'm, I'm sitting out here in the field. I'm, I'm actually getting ready. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're getting set up. Got my arrow on the string. So when I'm set up, 
I got my obstacle behind me. So again, the tree is behind me, not in front of me, not to the side of me, behind me. So the tree's behind me. And first thing I do when I set up, I put that release on. So many of us are doing this. We're calling, we're blowing our beagle tube, we're cow calling. And I know if anybody out there has been successful, even if you haven't been successful, but you've been close, putting this release on that loop sometimes can be the hardest thing in the entire world. You're calling and all the you're coming. And you're sitting here trying to look at the bull and you're like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm just in that situation. But again, you're set up. First thing I do, got the background behind me. Release is on. Now I'm calling. I'm calling here right here by my mouth. Everything is here, but my release is on, so I'm ready. Next thing I do is when that bull comes in, I have my bow out three quarters away in front of me, and all I do is follow that animal. Literally, I am looking down my string right to my sight. Everything is in line, and I just slowly stay with that animal. A lot of guys go straight to the point where they think they're going to draw, but all of a sudden that bull will stop a little early, and they're forced to move. Once that bull stops, he's got you. So again, instead of going to the opening which you're going to shoot, I stay with the animal. The focus of that is no matter where that animal stops, I can draw back and I can shoot. So again, instead of finding the gap and holding there, I stay with my animal. So I just sit here, I follow him, I follow him, I follow him. When I'm ready to go, you just push and pull and I'm there. I'm right to my draw point, I'm looking down my pins and I'm ready to fire. I'm ready to go and I'm set. Again, instead of the fact of doing this big heave ho, this skyrocket to the moon. Make sure that you can draw your bow slow. Make sure you can draw your bow comfortably. Again, you see me draw, I have to put a lot of power into that. If I'm drawing at the range, I draw it straight back, it's easy, I draw fast. But in a hunting situation, I wanna make sure that I can draw very slow. Yeah, it, I'm not gonna say that it doesn't look like I'm struggling, but it's for the fact that I want to go slow. So again, very slow, easy right on target, I'm hardly moving at all. So again, you gotta make sure that in all those situations, you can draw your bow in every situation, but you can draw it easily, you can draw it smoothly, and with the least amount of movement as possible. The movement will kill you at the end. So again, don't find the, the gap in which you're shooting, stay with your animal. Looking right down that string, right through your pins, everything's in line, follow that animal. Don't take it off the animal, so whenever he stops, you can draw and shoot. Stay with the animal when the time's right, draw back, your pins are already set up, you're already in line, let the arrow fly, and you got yourself an animal on the ground. So again, think about those small things, but again, easy draw is gonna get you done at the end of the day. Um, as we go down the list, the last couple things we're gonna talk about is foreign noise, or the last thing we're gonna talk about is foreign noise. When it comes to foreign noise, again, you can get by with natural noise. As I walk through the woods, I step on branches. I make a lot of natural sounds. If you ever watch a big elk, a big mule deer, a bear, a whitetail go through the woods, they make noise. It's what it is. I mean, they, they step on branches, they step on twigs, they, they leaves. There's a lot of noise in the, in the woods, especially on a natural animal. When an animal is on alert, they walk a little quieter, but just a natural, normal day, they make a lot of noise when going through the woods but it's always that natural tones. Foreign noise, change in the pocket. A half empty water bottle is the worst thing. Half empty coffee, um, things like that just kill you. If you, you know, don't have a water bladder in your backpack and you, you know, use a canteen or whatever, sloshing water kills you. Change in the pocket kills you. you know, straps on a backpack slapping. Foreign noise is awful. So put on your gear right now, jump around, make noise, make sure you don't have anything foreign. Ask somebody to walk behind you and listen for that foreign noise. The simple littlest things. I don't care if you're hiking 10 miles in the woods on a backpack hunt, never slam your car door. Once hunting season starts, no slamming the car door. I can't tell you how many times I go in the field with people, and again, I'm planning on going miles in, but if I'm in the woods, you never know when you're gonna run into that animal that's right next to you. Never slam that car door. Always close it quietly. It's the point to where, you know, my wife will make fun of me because we're going to the grocery store, you know, in September, and I'm like easing my door shut because it's so a habit of mine to close that car door quietly. Again, everybody's listening to this being like, duh, that's easy. I can't tell you how many times people are slamming those doors. So don't slam the car door. Make it simple. Uh, other little foreign noises, make sure your car alarm. Everybody thinks about the car alarm, but they don't think about when they lock their door in the field, how their horn might you know, do the little double honk uh, to show them that their car doors are locked. 
Make sure you know all those foreign noises. Me personally, I'm so worried about an alarm going off. A lot of times I'll pull the fuse from my alarm once I get into the field hunting. I'll throw it back in before I drive, but in the field, I'll pop that fuse out for that horn to make sure no hit uh, anything like that. Because again, foreign noise is absolutely terrible in any situation. Uh, guys, that's the top list uh, of the common mistakes that I see. Now again, I can make this show two hours long talking about all the mistakes out there, but those are the ones that I see most commonly. Those are the mistakes that I think on a daily basis hurt the average hunter uh, out here in the field. So again, it makes you a more successful hunter. Guys, we did a long show tonight, so we're just gonna take one question. Uh, so we're gonna grab one question here, we'll answer that. Uh, and just remind everybody again, join me every Monday night, 7 p.m. Pacific. We would love to answer all your questions. Again, next week we're gonna take a lot more questions, uh, just because tonight we ran over a little bit. But Devin, what do we got for a question? All right, we're gonna kind of cut out some of the specifics in this as far as what unit and everything, but here it goes. Uh, co coming from Cody Lawhorn, I am specifically hunting first season either sex rifle elk in a unit that is arguably the most pressured unit in Colorado. I see elk on my game cams and I see them when I'm scouting on the weekends, but I can't seem to figure out a pattern. I'm only seeing a single animal or two at a time. I see some cows with calves at higher elevation and bulls a bit lower on my camera. Should I focus on getting closer to private property boundaries and lower elevation to pick apart the dark timber and the tree lines? So absolutely, I mean, obviously, Cody, there's a, there's a lot there uh, to talk about. And I know that you uh, you mentioned some of the stuff, the units that you're at and the areas you're at. Um, there's a lot of, of different concepts there. Number one, I would look at your cameras and I try to put together somewhat of a pattern of time or the reason why they're there. Are your cameras on water? Are they on bedding zones or you know trails going into bedding zones uh, or feeding areas? So number one thing, especially in highly pressured areas. So with pressure, you assume the animals are gonna get pushed around a little bit. So I number one, we're gonna look for those little areas like we talked about, nooks and crannies. So I'm gonna to look to either go really far to where I avoid the crowds, or I'm gonna look for rough terrain. Look for some cliffs, some rocky areas. Not that the elk are necessarily gonna be on those rocky areas, but more the fact that the rocky areas are gonna keep the hunters out, and hopefully just beyond that rough country, you're gonna find some pristine elk hunting. So number one, I would look for that. I'd look for some areas that might not feel the pressure, Number two, anytime that I, I generally am gonna say that you have a lot of pressure, a lot of times you're gonna bring on somewhat call shy animals. Anytime we have call shy animals, we resort to water. So I would put a major focus right now on finding every, every water hole, every wallow, everywhere where you think these animals are gonna drink, and I would put a lot of focus on, put my cameras on the water, and I would put a major focus on learning the water areas, because again, that's gonna develop a pattern for you uh, that hopefully will, will resume to, to being a pattern every day uh, to hopefully let you be more successful as you come up on that first rifle season. Um, as far as the private property, if you're, like we talked about in one of the first units, or first uh, uh, podcast or live feeds, if you're in a situation where the private property does not hunt, um, you definitely are going to see more animals around there. So if the private property does not put pressure on those animals, I would say you're going to get some gravitation towards those areas, uh, and it sometimes can be worth looking around there. The problem is, once there's a lot of pressure, they're never going to come off that private property. But it's a good area to start looking. But if it's a private property that's going to put hunting pressure on these animals, it washes itself out. If what the pressure they put on them is going to, going to be the same as the, as the National Forest, so it's almost going to be a wash. I wouldn't look for that private property if they're going to hunt that private property. Um, so my two biggest pieces of advice. Number one, I would find water. Water is going to be key for you. So find water, start to pick apart that water, and start learning which water is getting hit. Um, again, there's a lot of water out there. You just got to find which one these animals tend to like a little more. Number two, I would spend a lot of time behind a spotting scope at long distance. So I would spend a lot of time on the highest peaks you can find, and I would put on. I would search all the valleys, especially in kind of you know the the medium terrain or the medium elevation, say the six to nine thousand feet every little drainage that has that nice meadow in the bottom, you're gonna find a handful of animals in each of those little drainages. So instead of physically walking in there and risk spooking these animals, I'd put a major focus on sitting up high and looking three, four miles through a spawning scope to try to find mass groups of these animals. Once you start finding bigger groups and, and overall numbers of these animals, 
I would start putting uh, you know a little bit closer intel on those and actually building the daily patterns. But water and long distance scouting are going to be the two things that, that do that the most for you. And I hunt a lot of overpressured units as well, so I definitely know where you're coming from. Uh, you know where there's tons of hunters, tons of just overall general traffic, uh, and the long distance scouting is definitely how I overcome most of those areas to at least start the pattern. I'm not saying that that's going to get you all the way to the end, but you know, climb the tallest peak or just get to where you can see and, and start glassing a long ways, and that's where where good glass is going to come really into play. Uh, you know, get yourself a, a good spotting scope. I mean, talking about the value on glass, uh, we're spending a lot of time behind a loophole spotting scope right now, like a, a 20 by 60, uh, you know, by whatever objective you would look for. It'll be a, a piece of glass that you can do that three four miles. It's going to be enough power um, to look those three four miles to where all of a sudden you can start saying, hey. I found 15 groups of elk today. These are the ones that, that seem to be in the best terrain for common wind, for a good pattern. And we're going to put more uh, more intel on building the patterns on those individual animals. So hopefully that helps, Cody. But again, water, number one, long distance scouting behind the spotting scope is going to be the second thing that really is going to help you build those patterns. So guys, again, I am Nate Zielinski coming to you live from the Bowtech Facebook page, the Diamond Archery Facebook page, Tightline Outdoors, and Nate Zielinski. With that said, guys, really go find Nate Zielinski on Facebook. Give the page a like. It's brand new. Uh, we'll have a lot more information for a lot more pictures of all the animals that I've been scouting. Uh, so make sure you join me there. Again, a huge thanks to, to Bowtech Archery for giving us this live feed, guys. We appreciate them allowing us to go live on their channels, uh, use their resource to talk about hunting. It's, a, it's something that we all love, and we're just about promoting that education to where hopefully everybody's successful and bring somebody else new in the in the field. Hopefully, we just continue to grow the sport of hunting. Uh, so, again, huge thanks to Bowtech for that. Also, make sure you come back to this page live on Wednesday. We have Chef Collins. We got Randy Newberg. Both absolutely incredible shows that you want to watch live. So, again, get the information for that. Sign up for notifications. Make sure you come back Wednesday uh, for both those shows there. And, guys, we will see you next Monday. 7 p.m. Pacific. Again, I am Nate Zilski coming to you live. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. Talk about hunting. It's, a, it's something that we all love, and we're just about promoting that education to where hopefully everybody's successful and bring somebody else new in the in the field. Hopefully, we just continue to grow the sport of hunting. Uh, so, again, huge thanks to Bowtech for that. Also, make sure you come back to this page live on Wednesday. We have Chef Collins. We got Randy Newberg. Both absolutely incredible shows that you want to watch live. So, again, get the information for that. Sign up for notifications. Make sure you come back Wednesday uh, for both those shows there. And, guys, we will see you next Monday. 7 p.m. Pacific. Again, I am Nate Zilski coming to you live. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.